O my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, O all providing personality of Godhead, I offer my respect to obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primable cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent because there is no other cause. It is he him. only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. Of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes. Only because of him do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature. Temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Shri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Shri Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate world. upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaito vutra. Dharma projita kaito vutra. Paramo nirmat saranam satam. Paramo nirmat saranam satam. Vidyam vastava matra vastu. Vidyam vastava matra vastu. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimva Parir Ishwaraha. Kimva Parir Ishwaraha. Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra. Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra. Kriti Bihi Susu Subhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth of their reality is distinguished from illusion for the world. Such of truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established <coughs> within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within. Nigama kapatarur galitam phalam. Nigama kapatarur galitam phalam. Sukhamukad amrita dravya samyatam. Sukhamukad amrita dravya samyatam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur aho raska bhuvibhava kaha. Muhur aho raska bhuvibhava. O oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. O oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. The mature fruit, the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sugadeva Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sugadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectar and juice was already relishable for all. Although its nectar and juice was already relishable for including all. Including liberated souls. Including liberated Shin souls. Kata Krishna, Shrimvatam Swap Kata Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Hidiantak Stohi Bhadrani, Hidiantak Stohi Bhadrani, Vidu Nati Srihit Satam, Vidu Nati Srihit Satam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, or to hear from him directly through Bhagavad Gita, is itself righteous activity. It is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart. Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend. Acts as a best wishing friend. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. 
and purifies the body who is constantly engaged in the hearing. Nasta preshu bhadreshu. Nasta preshu bhadreshu. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhakti bhavati naistaki. Bhakti bhavati naistaki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam, as he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajasta mohabhava. Tadarajasta mohabhava. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Chete etar inavidan. Chete etar inavidan. Stitham sattve prasiddhati. Stitham sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat bhakti yoga. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangha se jayate. Mukta sangha se jayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When all the impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarva samsaya. Chidyante sarva samsaya. Siyante jasya karmani. Siyante sarva karmani. Drusta evat manishwari. Drusta evat manishwari. Thus Bhakti Yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. Bhakti Yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of samsayam samagran. And enables one to come at once to the stage of some shamans of God. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna is devotee in Krishna consciousness. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Can one understand the science of Krishna? She might Bhagavatam Canto One, Chapter Eighteen, Verse Number. Four. Nota mas loka vartanam. Jusatam tat katam ritam. Jusantam tat katam ritam. Chat sambra mo. Nata kali pi, siyat sam brahman nata kali pi, smaratam tat padam bujam, smaratam tat padam bujam. Translation by Shri Prabhupada. This was so because those who have dedicated their lives to the transcendental topics of the personality of Godhead, of whom the Vedic hymns sing, and who are constantly engaged in remembering the lotus feet of the Lord. Do not run the risk of having misconceptions even at the last moment of their lives. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The highest perfection of life is attained by remembering the transcendental nature of the Lord at the last moment of one's life. This perfection of life is made possible by one who has learned the actual transcendental nature of the Lord from the Vedic hymns sung by a liberated soul like Sukadeva Goswami or someone in a line of disciplic succession. There is no gain in hearing the Vedic hymns from some mental speculator. When the same is heard from an actual self-realized soul and it is properly understood by service and submission, everything becomes transparently clear. This Thus, a submissive disciple is able to live transcendentally and continue to the end of life. By scientific adaptation, one is able to remember the Lord even in the end of life, when the power of remembrance is slackened due to derangement of bodily membranes. For a common man, it is very difficult to remember things as they are at the time of death. But by the grace of the Lord and his bona fide devotees, 
the spiritual masters. One can get this, get this opportunity without difficulty, and it was done in the case of Maharaj Pariksit. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Maharaj Pariksit, as it says, after leaving all his associates, the king surrendered himself as a disciple to the son of Vyasa, Sukadeva Goswami, and thus he was able to understand the actual position of personality of Godhead. So, spiritual life begins formally when one accepts a spiritual master, bona fide spiritual master. It, it's, you might say it starts before that, but that's informal start. <coughs> the formal start is at the point of initiation. The informal start is when one has a little bit of faith to associate with devotees, because uh, such a person is attracted to devotees' behavior, lifestyle, uh, singing, dancing, prasadam, something attracts them and gives them some innate desire to associate. But in that association, they realize the importance of having a bona fide spiritual master and formally being initiated with vows of initiation that one must follow strictly. Then their spiritual life begins. So the Srimad Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita explains the psychology of action. And uh, it's one short, uh, one verse and one short purport, but it is very profound. It's 18th chapter, 18th verse that says, Kyanam Gyayam Parigyata Trivida Karma Chodana Karanam Karma Karteti Trivida Kama Sangraha. So this is a very nice verse, and it says, knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower are the three factors that motivate action. The senses, the work, and the doer are the three constituents of action. So in the purport, Prabhupada explains, there are three kinds of impetus for daily work, knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower. So knowledge means uh, Vedic knowledge, as explained in uh, 13th chapter, verses 8 to 12. That's the process of knowledge. And then the, the object of knowledge, that is Krishna, as he explains in the Bhagavad Gita, says that, uh, and, uh, and he is to be known through all the Vedas. Vedais chasarvir aham eva vedya. Vedanta krit veda vid eva chaham. He is the compiler of the Vedas. He's the knower of the Vedas. And yeah, so, and he's the object of the Vedic knowledge. Okay, so, there's knowledge, there's the object of knowledge, and the knower is the individual soul, the jiva. There are two knowers. There's the super knower, that's Krishna, that's Paramatma, and there's the jiva. So the jiva is inspired, or, or the impetus, or the inspiration, or the motivation comes from this knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower. Then there's the instruments of work. The instruments of work are, are the uh, senses, the work itself, and the worker. Uh, or the constituents, I'm sorry, the constituents of work are the, the senses, the, uh, object, uh, the uh, work itself, and the worker. Okay, so now that's that's what this verse says. But now there's more information. Prabhupada says, any work done by any human being has these elements. Before one acts, 
there is some impetus, which is called inspiration or motivation. Any solution arrived at before work is actualized in a subtle form of work. The work takes the form of action. First, one has to undergo the psychological processes of thinking, feeling, and willing. And that is called impetus. The inspiration of work is the same if it comes from the scriptures or from the instruction of the spiritual master. When the inspiration is there and the worker is there, then actual activity takes place by the help of the senses, including the mind, which is the center of all the senses. The sum total of all the constituents of an activity are called the accumulation of work. So, this explains, this is the psychology, you could say, of, of work or action. And if we understand this, then uh, certain things happen in our life. This is happening without our knowledge. But when we become educated in Bhagavad Gita, then we understand how it's happening. And then we can transfer it from the confused set of, of uh, efforts that we make in life for sense gratification to uh, to the real object of knowledge, which is Vedaisya Sarvaraham Eva Vidya, that Krishna is to be known through all the Vedic literatures. And Vedic literatures means real knowledge. Okay, so this was also exemplified <clears throat> and explained in depth in the life of Narada Muni. <clears throat> and what we're going to hear now is just absolutely incredible and amazing because we're going to understand what happens at the moment of death for a devotee and it's it's uh, it's it's absolutely amazing and it happens through what we just read which is the accumulation of work the sum total of all the constituents of activity so Narada Muni uh, was very fortunate, although he was born in a, in a single parent family and he, his mother was very poor and, and she could not uh, send him to school. She had no money, hardly any money at all. But she was a, a, a maid servant and fortunately she served some pure devotees for uh, four months of the chatur uh, mas, or the uh, four months uh, uh, where uh, saintly people stay in one place during the rainy season and perform uh, kirtan and uh, scriptural studies and, and recitation and just live very simply. So she was a servant, and of course her five-year-old boy was with her, so he associated with those great saintly personalities. He, he, instead of being frivolous and playing uh, sports and things like that, he, was, he, he, he developed an attraction to hearing them, although he didn't, he didn't understand uh, everything they were saying, but he was very curious to hear them, and he also offered some service, and he was fortunate enough to be able to taste some of the remnants of their prasadam. So he, although he was very poor, he had no formal education, but he had a natural attraction to hearing from these great authorities. So, Prabhupada explains, <clears throat> he says, the personality of Godhead is described in the Bhagavad Gita as the most pure the supreme and the absolute truth. There's no trace of a tinge of materiality in his person. And thus, one who has the slightest tinge of material affection cannot approach him. 
The beginning of devotional service starts from the point when one is freed from at least two forms of material modes, namely the mode of passion and the mode of ignorance. The result is exhibited by the signs of being freed from kama, lust, and loba, covetousness. In other words, greedy desires. That is to say, one must be freed from the desires for sense gratification and avarice for sense gratification. So, we understand what desire for sense gratification means, but then he says the avarice for sense gratification. Now, avarice has a specific meaning in English. It means the highest level of greed. That's what avarice means. It's not just desire. It's the highest level of greed. Excessive, insatiable desire for more wealth and more prestige and more sense gratification. So it's like a very dangerous thing, this avarice. <laughs> so you have to be, one has to be freed from lust and loba or the sense satisfaction, desires for sense gratification, and avarice for sense gratification. So in the mode of goodness, one can begin to make some spiritual advancement. But to actually advance toward the goal, one has to be free also of the mode of goodness. So therefore, sometimes people go to the forest to try and live a natural life and get away from the big city and all that. Uh, but that's in the mode of goodness. But when you live in a temple, or the temple is your main focus in life, the temple is transcendental. So better than going to the forest to live a simple life is to live in or near the temple and regularly come. So the temple of the Lord, Prabhupada says, is a transcendental place, whereas the forest is a materially good habitation. habitation. The neof a neophyte devotee is always recommended to worship the deity of the Lord, Archana, rather than go into the forest to search out the Lord. Devotional service begins from the process of Archana, which is better than going out in the forest. Okay, so then Prabhupada says, and, and uh, Narada Muni, he associated with these pure devotees and he became purified in their association. And then after that, uh, he didn't go into the forest to live a simple life. He began to travel from one planet to another, one place to another, to convert men, gods, kinaras, gandharvas, rishis, munis, and all others to become devotees of the Lord. And by his activities, he engaged and he inspired such people as Prahlad Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj and many others to engage in the transcendental service of the Lord. Therefore, Prabhupada says, a pure devotee of the Lord therefore follows in the footsteps of the great devotees like Narada and Prahlada and engages his whole time in glorifying the Lord by the process of kirtana. Such a preaching process is transcendental to all material qualities. So now we see in the example of Narada Muni, uh, what is an ideal devotee and what steps have to be taken to uh, clear the path to transcendental life and transcendental activity. Then it's also said that Prabhupada says that a living being is not a dead stone. A living being cannot be uh, uh, desireless, uh, one must have desires. Now yesterday we read that purport 271 that explains that desirelessness means not desiring any sense gratification and only desiring to please Krishna. That's real desirelessness, right? So, but we all have to be 
thinking, feeling, and willing. It's just natural because those are the prerequisites of work and everyone has to do something, has to have some type of action or work in life. Prabhupada says, but when he thinks, feels, and wills materially, he or she becomes entangled. And conversely, when he thinks, feels, and wills for the service of the Lord, he becomes gradually freed from all entanglement. So, this, these are two laws of material nature. Thinking, feeling, and willing, uh, materially, one becomes entangled. And thinking, feeling, and willing, spiritually, one becomes liberated. And Prabhupada says, the more a person is engaged in transcendental loving service to the Lord, the more he acquires a hankering for it. This is the transcendental nature of godly service. So, this is a fact. And this hankering for more service is insatiable. It's never satisfied. This is another law of nature. However, when uh, a person uh, acquires a hankering for sense gratification, they at one point becomes satiated. They, they become bored with it. They don't, they, they, they become tired of it. You know. But in spiritual service of the Lord has no satiation. It never ends. So this is a difference. One can go on increasing his hankerings for the loving transcendental service of the Lord and yet he will find he will not find satiation or end. By intense service to the Lord, one can experience the presence of the Lord transcendentally. Therefore, seeing the Lord means being engaged in his service because his service and his person are identical. The Lord will give proper direction as to how and where it has to be done. There was no material desire in Narada, and yet, just to increase his intense desire for the Lord, he was so advised. The Lord himself advised him. Because Narada Muni, at one point, saw the Lord when he was very young, like five years old. And, and he saw the Lord by engaging in some kind of intense meditation. And then he didn't see the Lord. And then he tried that intense meditation again over and over and it didn't produce the same result. And at that point, the Lord spoke to him. He could not see him, but he could hear him speaking. And he said, look, I let you see me so that for the rest of your life, you'll be inspired to find me and to, to attain to me. But you'll never be able to see me again in this lifetime. That's very interesting. Uh, so you'll see that some great devotees like Prahlad Maharaj and Dhruva Maharaj and Pariksit Maharaj had sh a short period of actually seeing the Lord and then they didn't see him again for the rest of their life but that was enough to keep them inspired to always be engaged in devotional service very, very interesting. <clears throat> but here Prabhupada says, therefore seeing the Lord means being engaged in his service because his service and his person are identical. The sincere devotee should go on with sincere service of the Lord. The Lord will give proper direction as to how and where it has to be done. <clears throat> there was no material desire in Narada and yet, just to increase his intense desire for the Lord, he was so advised. Okay. So then, uh, Krishna, uh, Sukadeva Goswami explains, by service to the absolute truth, even for a few days, a devotee attains firm and fixed intelligence in me, or Krishna. Consequently, he goes on to become my associate in the transcendental world after giving up the present deplorable material worlds. 
So, the serving the Lord should always be under the direction of the bona fide spiritual master who is a transparent via medium between the Lord and the neophyte devotee. The neophyte devotee has no ability to approach the absolute personality of Godhead by the strength of his present imperfect material senses. And therefore, under the direction of the spiritual master, he is trained in transcendental service of the Lord. And by such training, even for some days, the neophyte devotee gets intelligence in such transcendental service, which leads him ultimately to get free from perpetual inhabitation in the material worlds and to be promoted to the transcendental world to become one of the liberated associates of the Lord in the kingdom of God. So, it's interesting. The uh, Protestant church was started by Martin Luther King and other persons who wanted reformation of the Catholic Church because the, the, the popes and, and uh, priests and so forth, in their estimation, had become corrupted, had become pr corrupted. And, and in what way? They were performing pujas for material advancement and getting paid for it. And this really, really became so atrocious that eventually there was a reaction, and the reaction was the Protestant movement, which started around uh, the 15th century. And what does Protestant mean? There were protesters. Protestant means protesters. They were protesting what they considered was uh, corruption in the Catholic Church. And we won't go into it, but uh, they were protesting the materialization of spirituality, doing all these pujas for material benefit. So it's not only in Hinduism, it's in uh, the Christian Church, it's in Buddhism, it's in Islam also. That's why it says that there's two tracks in every religion. One is the uh, poverty, and the other is nivriti. Poverty means uh, you perform religious activity because you're attracted by the material benefits. And nivriti means you're not attract attracted by any material benefits. You're just simply attracted by the Lord himself. So. Uh, Prabhupada says that that the person of Godhead was not seen but only heard does not make any difference. The person of Godhead produced the four Vedas by his breathing and he is seen and realized through the transcendental sound of the Vedas. Similarly, the Bhagavad Gita is the sound representation of the Lord and there's no difference in identity. The conclusion is that the Lord can be seen and heard by persistent chanting of the transcendental sound. It's like now uh, the uh, Gita Jayanti is coming up and we're gonna recite the entire Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is Krishna speaking. It's the sound vibration of the Lord and as it says here that personality Godhead uh, is not different. He's not necessarily seen, but he's heard. And it doesn't make a difference whether you hear him or you see him. <clears throat> so the Bhagavad Gita is the sound representation of the Lord, and there's no difference in identity. So by this constant hearing and chanting, the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, the hearing and chanting transcendental sounds, not mundane sounds. Just like we see uh, at one time the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call that, the radio box, the big box. People would carry a big box in uh, Seattle and other places. <laughs> and uh, 
they have the earphones on and they're listening. Now, nowadays, it's a small box. It's not a big box anymore. But they're walking down the street and they're going like this, jumping up and down. And, you know, so, oh, you know, it's, and, you know, they're hearing this sound, right? Or they're in their car and they just boom, 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 boom. They're hearing these sounds, right? Rap music or rat music, whatever it is. And it's completely uh, uh, destroying their, their mind. In fact, there's a uh, Japanese scientist uh, who uh, was studying the effect of sound on the mind of a human being and on other things too, like animals and so forth. And he was registering on a diagram uh, uh, the effect of sound on, on, a, on a human being. So they put all these you know, probes and wires or whatever on the brain, right? And then they, uh, they, they blast some music and then they see how the, the brain waves are, are going. So when they put rat music and heavy metal, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, movement was like, you know, big, big lines up and down, you know, like the mind is being decomposed, right? And then when they put uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, et cetera, you know, then it was very gentle movement. So you see, uh, then he, then he, uh, also did experiments with uh, water, and he uh, analyzed the uh, crystalline structure of, of water, or the structure of water in, in, in its natural state. And then when he bombarded it with uh, uh, heavy metal music, it, it destroyed the structure. Well, the mind is full of liquid, right? So. <laughs> So he proved that the sound has a definite effect on the mind. And uh, so when we see young kids, you know, with their uh, uh, music box, either it's a small uh, box now or the big one, or they're, they're driving in cars and listening to this movement and, and music and moving around like this and yelling and things like that, uh, it's very, very disruptive to the mind. So, therefore, the conclusion is that the Lord can be seen and heard by persistent chanting of the transcendental sound. And then, uh, Narada Muni says, Thus I began chanting the holy name and fame of the Lord by repeated recitation, ignoring all the formalities of the material world. Such chanting and remembering of the transcendental pastimes of the Lord are benedictory. So doing, I traveled all over the earth, fully satisfied, humble, and unenvious. This is the effect of preoccupying the mind with transcendental sound. And Prabhupada says, the life of a sincere devotee of the Lord is thus explained in a nutshell by Narada Muni, by his personal example. Such a devotee, after his initiation by the Lord or his bona fide representative, takes very seriously chanting of the glories of the Lord and traveling all over the world so that others may also hear the glories of the Lord. Such devotees have no desire for material gain. They are conducted by one single desire to go back to Godhead. This awaits them in due course on quitting the material body because they have the highest aim of life going back to Godhead. They're never envious of anyone nor are they proud of being eligible to go back to Godhead. Their only business is to chant and remember the holy name, fame, and pastimes of the Lord, and according to personal capacity, to distribute the message for others' welfare without motive of material gain. Wow, there you go. That's the life of a sincere devotee. This is Canto 1, chapter 6, verse number 26. And then it explains... And so the Brahmana, Vyasadeva, in due course of time, uh, and then Narada Muni explains, and so, O Brahmana Vyasadeva, he's talking to Vyasadeva, in due course of time, Vyasadeva is his disciple. 
I, who was fully absorbed in thinking of Krishna and who therefore had no attachments, being completely freed from all material taints, met with death as lightning and illumination occur simultaneously. Now, this is, this is the death of a real devotee, a pure devotee, right? It's not something miserable. It's not something, you know, painful. It's not something, you know, auspicious. This is something amazing. Like lightning and illumination occurring simultaneously. And Prabhupada explains, to be fully absorbed in the thought of Krishna means clearance of material dirts or hankerings. So these desires, I want this, I want that. I would like to do this, I would like to do that. And this way I can make some money here and I can increase my uh, position there and I can do this over there and this and that. These are all hankerings. And so therefore, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma, na sochati na kangsati, one who is situated in, in Brahman realization, they are prasanatma, they're completely self-satisfied, and they're free of all hankerings and lamentation. So Prabhupada explains, to be fully absorbed in the thoughts of Krishna means clearance of material dirts or hankerings. As a very rich man has no hankerings for small petty things, so also a devotee of Lord Krishna, who is guaranteed to pass on to the kingdom of God, where life is eternal, fully cognizant and blissful, naturally has no hankerings for petty material things, which are like dolls or shadow, shadows of the reality and are without permanent value. That is the sign of spiritually enriched persons. And in due course of time, when a pure devotee is completely prepared, all of a sudden, the change of body occurs, which is commonly called death. And for the pure devotee, such a change takes place exactly like lightning and illumination follows simultaneously. That is to say, a devotee simultaneously changes his material body and develops a spiritual body by the will of the Supreme. Even before death, a pure devotee has no material affection due to his body's being spiritualized like a red hot iron in contact with fire. This is an amazing explanation by Prabhupada, explaining what happens at the moment of death for a devotee. And then, we'll end with this, then uh, <clears throat> Narada Muni explains again to Vyasadeva, having been awarded a transcendental body befitting an associate of the personality Godhead, I quit the body made of five material elements, and thus all acquired fruit of results of work karma stopped. So three things happen. Three important things happen when you have either a spiritualized body in this life, that's also explained by Prabhupada, or your eternal spiritual body at the moment of death. Prabhupada explains, informed by the personality of Godhead that he would be awarded a transcendental body befitting the Lord's association. And this is when Narada is only like five years old. Right? Narada got his spiritual body as soon as he quitted, or as soon as he should be quit his material body. This transcendental body is free from material affinity and invested with three primary transcendental qualities, namely, eternity, freedom from the modes of nature, and freedom from reactions of fruit of activities. In other words, one is free of karma, free of the three modes, and eternal. The material body is always afflicted with the lack of these three qualities, yes. A devotee's body becomes at once surcharged with the transcendental qualities as soon as he is engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. In other words, if we engage sincerely in devotional service right away, these three things happen right away. Uh, in this sense, uh, at least two of these three things happens right away. <clears throat> Uh, 
that is. Uh, okay, anyway, the material body is always afflicted with the lack of these three qualities. A devotee's body becomes at once surcharged with the transcendental qualities as soon as he's engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. It acts like the magnet influence of a touchstone upon iron. Touchstone is a real thing. You can buy one. They're for sale on Amazon. Yeah. Touchstone basically is a magnet, but a naturally occurring magnet. It's a type of stone that naturally is magnetic. So if you want to buy one, they have all different sizes, by the way. <laughs> you have little ones like this, you have big ones like that. You've got to be careful, otherwise, you know, uh, a lot of things are attracted to it, you know, especially the big ones. But uh, uh, it's something that exists. So, therefore, it says, it acts like the magnet influence of a touchstone upon iron. The influence of transcendental devotional service is like that. Therefore, a change of the body means stoppage of the reaction of the three qualitative modes of material nature upon the pure devotee. There are many instances of this in the revealed scriptures. Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Mar Maharaj and many other devotees were able to see the personality of Godhead face to face apparently in the same body. This means that the quality of a devotee's body changes from material to transcendence. That is the opinion of the authorized Goswamis via the authentic scriptures. In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that beginning from the Indra Gopa germ up to the great Indra, king of heaven, all living beings are subjected to the law of karma and are bound to suffer and enjoy the fruit of results of their work only the devotee is exempt from such reactions by the causeless mercy of the supreme authority, personality got it. So at least two of those three things happen very quickly if we engage in devotional service. And the third thing will happen at the moment of death. So those two things are, we become free of the influence of the modes of material nature by constant engagement in devotional service, mam chayo vibhicharina bhakti yogina sevate sagunam samatitya etan brahma buyaya kalpate. 14th chapter, 26th verse says, one who engages in devotional service and does not fall down under any circumstance at once uh, transcends the modes of material nature and merges into Brahman or comes to the level of the state of Brahman, which is no more hankering, no more lamentation, and being fully satisfied by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization in Krishna consciousness. So this was very interesting. I wanted to bring this subject up to explain what happens to a, a pure devotee at the moment of death and what happens even before that for the devotee who always engages in devotional service? So we'll stop right there. Are there any questions? And all this is due to uh, being inspired and being motivated and being, uh, let's say, having an impetus for associating with devotees and regularly hearing and chanting in the association of devotees, and especially taking formal initiation and accepting to humbly uh, engage the rest of one's life in devotional service with the help of gurus, Shikshan Dixi gurus. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, in few days before uh, you were dis uh, explaining about knowledge. About what? Knowledge. Yes. Um, so in that, uh, Prabhupada says uh, knowledge is nothing but uh, the preliminary stage of understanding devotional service perfectly. 
in that amanitvam, that verses, I guess. And Krishna says, in, in multiple places, I was just trying to read in the 13th chapter, uh, Krishna says, O sign of Bharata, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies. And to understand this body and the knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. Well, the, understand this body means understand the 24 elements of the body. Mm -hmm. And then you also understand the 25th element, which is the jiva. And then you understand the 26th element, which is paramatma. That's the complete understanding of okay. the body. It's not just... 24 elements. It's 24 elements, but that's dead matter. Dead matter only looks like it's living because of the presence of the jiva and paramatma. Okay. And then in that 8 to 12, that um, humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, all that, and Krishna says, um, all these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever they may be is it's ignorance. ignorance. Yeah. Ajnana. Uh, <laughs> So that includes uh, C++ uh, programming and uh, JavaScript and all that stuff. <laughs> so I'm kind of, uh, I mean, there are so many places, the different, different things. Are However, knowledge. if you can use those things in Krishna's service by dovetailing them, mm -hmm. then that effort is not ignorance. Okay. Because I got confused because some places this uh, 20 characteristics seems to be the... Um, the core of knowledge. Uh -huh. And the other place it says like about the body, the knower and things. So I was just trying to connect how there are a lot of information uh, in well, the name no, of okay. knowledge. All right. the, there are uh, there's different ways to say this. But the actual words are jnanam and uh, jnanam, jnanam and uh, ganagamyam. Uh, anyway, let me show you the verse. Uh, 13th chapter. <clears throat> and verse number... Once you know the Sanskrit words, then you don't get confused. One, one, one second, one second. Mm. So, the three words are Shetram, Jnanam, and Gyeyam. Shetram, so 13th chapter, 19th verse. Shetram, Jnanam, and Gyeyam. Shetram means the body or the field of activities. Jnana means the process of knowledge, and Gaya means the object of knowledge. All right. Now, there are different ways of saying it, but those are the exact words. Jnana, and Chetram, and Chetram, Jnana, and Gaya. All right, 13th chapter, 19th verse. So, chetra means the field of activity, that's the body. And jnana means the process of knowledge. And gaya means the object of knowledge, Krishna. Okay? Do you have uh, lectures? Prabhupada's given. Speak in a microphone, Prabhupada, come on. We want to hear, bring it a little closer. We want to hear every word you say. <laughs> it's too loud. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, um, I listened to a lecture on, on that verse. Prabhupada you know, explains very nicely. If you have a, uh, a lecture of Bhagavad Gita series of Prabhupada, he explained that verse nicely. Yeah, it's really, really good. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, glories to Srila Prabhupada Kijay. Haribo, Haribo.